O Lord, make us instruments of your peace. Take our minds and think through them. Take our mouths and speak through them. Take our hands and work through them. And take our hearts and set them on fire for Christ's sake. Amen. Please be seated. Next week, we join Christ for his final entry into Jerusalem. It's time to get ready. It's time to be bold. Today, we're asked, along with Jesus and Paul and Mary, what does it mean for us to risk all we have and everything we are? because things are never going to be the same. Through the prophet Isaiah, God tells us, I am about to do a new thing. Do not consider things of old. Now, most of us see the future as some version of the past. We often have fixed expectations of who we are, who others may be, and how the world works, and we seem to find plenty of evidence to confirm that fact. Nothing changes, so we say. How often have we heard that saying, history repeats itself, or if not exactly, it certainly rhymes. The geopolitical events of the past month seem awfully reminiscent of the 1930s, and for all the recent advances in civil rights, it seems that we are on the precipice of having many of those hard-won reforms negated by a politically reactionary Supreme Court that no longer cares about protecting minority rights, nor not only tossing out our legal precedent about reproductive rights, but privacy and marriage rights as well. We've even heard congressmen say that it should be left to the states to rule on issues of interracial marriage. Now, if that doesn't send shock waves, waves through our souls, I don't know what should. Ugly voices of racism and misogyny are being reinvigorated, albeit in sometimes more sophisticated forms than in years past. And the divisions of East and West are as estranged as, and belligerent as ever. 1940, here we come. But as Christians, we live into another possibility. Our history is not destiny. And our scriptures today invite us to remember that as followers of Jesus Christ, we live into the possibility that all of our old expectations are dust, that we are fertile soil in which new life springs forth. The question for us is, how dirty are we willing to get to make that happen? How extravagantly are we willing to respond to Christ's presence in our lives? How boldly are we willing to proclaim the possibility to others that Christ can change lives, change outcomes? And what are we willing to risk as we approach our own crosses? Paul wrote to his brothers and sisters in Philippi that he was willing to risk it all to set aside everything that gave him pride and status. Because despite his imprisonment, he had tasted the freedom of Christ's life and death and resurrection. Paul, before his road to Damascus experience, had been the most righteous of Jews. He knew he was among God's chosen, 
pure Jew by birth, circumcised on the eighth day as the law demanded. Saul, as Paul was then known, became a Pharisee and a fierce protector of the Jewish purity laws and their historic traditions. He was set. And yet, to the community at Philippi, Paul counted all of these achievements as rubbish. He celebrated his freedom and the ability to be truly righteous, not because of laws, but rather in response to the astounding and relentless grace of God in Christ Jesus. Paul discovered that righteousness was not an achievement to be proved, that one that approved one's worthiness and one's belonging among God's chosen. No, righteousness was a faith-filled response to something God had freely given to us all. Everything that the world values, prestige, wealth, reputation, comfort, Paul gave up in response to the Jesus that was revealed to him. He writes, For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things that my culture valued. Paul didn't continue to, set, uh, to act as he always did. Paul strove to live the life Jesus lived with all of its sufferings, even becoming like him to his death. When most people today talk about their faith, how many of you think that they are willing to sacrifice all of their comforts, their relationships, their reputations, even their very lives? I have a hard time picturing it for myself. Sometimes it takes every ounce of energy I have not to just throw up my hands and say, Lord, I can't do it. I can't bear it all. But I'm grateful for Paul's words because he assures me I'm not alone. Even Paul confesses that he can't achieve anything by himself. He writes, not that I have already obtained this or reached this goal, but I press on to make it my own. Christ, because Christ Jesus made me his own. There's a profound freedom and peace in those words when we're not prisoners of our own impulses and egos. There, there's an appreciation that has grown in me over the years as the fears and anxieties that we're, are the hallmarks of a narrow and self-absorbed life have been pushed to the margins. And if anyone ma managed to live a life that is the opposite of a narrow and self-absorbed life, it was Jesus. But in John's Gospel today, Jesus is at the home of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, just a few miles outside of Jerusalem. Pa Passover was less than a week away, and, and Jesus knew what was in store when he would enter the city that next day. And though that day that they rem we remember as Palm Sunday. And other disciples were present, including Judas and Mary, made one of the most, uh, and, and then Ma Mary made one of the most d courageous and extravagant and some would say even scandalous gestures uh, imaginable. She spent a huge sum of money on a full pound of perfume made of pure nard and anointed at Jesus' feet. And then in the presence of all of these men, she let her hair down an extremely sensuous, provocative, and private act. And then Mary wiped the excess perfume from Jesus' feet. I mean, she risked everything. Her wealth, her reputation, her security, her honor. 
to express her complete solidarity and love for Jesus, what he had been, what he had done, including the raising of her brother Lazarus from the dead. And she was willing to face bitter condemnation from society and even some of Jesus' disciples. Now, John's gospel community knew that kind of uh, disapproval. <laughs> they knew decades of persecution by both the Roman imperial forces and Jewish religious authorities. In his narratives, John illustrated some theological truths about the Messiah, not necessarily historical truths about Jesus' past. And he was equipping his community for a very rough road ahead. He knew that the poor continued to surround them. All of them knew that. They were, many were poor themselves. They were on the social and political margins. They had no certainty. They were struggling to understand what it meant to be followers of Christ when it had become clear that the return of the Messiah was not going to happen anytime soon, and it had already been 60 years. So perhaps they saw, the, and, and they saw corruption all around them. So perhaps it makes sense that our gospel writer focused on a corrupt betrayer in their midst and contrasted that betrayer with the faithfulness of Mary. Fearful Judas, well, he had abandoned his vulnerable community and threatened their future, despite parading as a holy disciple, because he could only see the possibility of a continuation of centuries of exile and domination. And trapped in that cynical mindset, he, he twisted the meaning and the significance of Mary's powerful, selfless act and, you know, that's what naysayers do, cowards do, to justify their actions. They try to undermine the truth that condemns them. Judas couldn't love as extravagantly as Mary or Jesus did because he was afraid. He was a coward. So when someone like Mary proved that it was possible with Jesus' approval, he had to be, she had to be negated and Jesus had to be betrayed and destroyed. Knowing Judas' heart, though, Jesus challenged him. You always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. And by this time, all his disciples knew how authentically Jesus stood in the prophetic tradition. Jesus had lived his life in service to the poor and the marginalized. But Jesus also knew that life is short. And for him, and for us, you know, imminently so. Life is like the swish of a horse's tail. We never know what next will come. But Jesus, Jesus knew that we must not live so fearfully that we cannot risk extra extravagance when our hearts are so moved. We mustn't live our lives in fear of what others think. And Mary knew this as well. Her brother Lazarus was alive because of Jesus. She knew what Jesus risked on her behalf. And she didn't buy that nard for herself. She never turned a blind eye to the need of those around her, but she was moved in that moment to show her love in an extravagant way and didn't let fear stand in her way. What are we willing to risk that shows our love for Christ? Can we risk looking foolish? 
Can we stretch our giving, whether it's to charities or a friend in need or to a stranger or to our church's mission? Can we risk stating boldly to a friend or an enemy alike that we love Jesus and that he is the center of our lives, even if it means that some may call us religious wackos or too liberal or too irresponsible? And what's more, are we willing to act in such an audacious way that people can't help noticing that we're not, that we not only love Jesus, but that we love like Jesus, boldly, prodigally, unmistakably, even at the risk of seeming crazy and radical. Paul and Mary did. Jesus did. And we can do it too. God has ensured that we are more than capable because he made us in God's image. Just as Jesus was made like us so that we could act more like him. Thanks be to God. Amen.